reached the time of the service where we continue our worship of God by the giving and receiving of the sermon. We're in Acts chapter 21, so let us turn there. If you're a guest with us today, we're in our sermon series in the book of Acts. We've progressed all the way up to chapter 21. This is the reading of God's word for the sermon. Let Spirit of Life come to attention. When we had parted from them and set sail, we ran a straight course to Kos and the next day to Rhodes, and from there to Patara, and having found a ship crossing over to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. When we came in sight of Cyprus, leaving it on the left, we kept sailing to Syria and landed at Tyre. For there the ship was to unload its cargo. And after looking up the disciples, we stayed there seven days. And they kept telling Paul through the Spirit not to set foot in Jerusalem. When our days there were ended, we left and started on our journey, while they all with their wives and children escorted us until we were out of the city. After kneeling down on the beach and praying, we said farewell to one another, and we went on board the ship, and they returned home again. When we had finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived at, we arrived at at Ptolemaeus, and after greeting the brethren, we stayed with them for a day. On the next day, we left and came to Caesarea, and entering the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, we stayed with him. Now, this man had four virgin daughters who were prophetesses. As we were staying there for some days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands, and said, this is what the Holy Spirit says. In this way, the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. When we heard this, we were, we as well as the local residents began begging him not to go to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, what are you doing weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but even to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we fell silent, remarking, the will of the Lord be done. This concludes the reading of God's word for the sermon. The church said, Amen. As we journey a little further with our missionary brother Paul, we are Positioned once again, positioned once again with pen in hand, with a, an open a notebook, with scripture open before us. But we're positioned more especially with our hearts and minds in a place of attention and readiness to read and to learn from the example of our Apostle Paul. His example, as we've been covering all the way in the book, book of Acts, has been shaping our evangelism, shaping our mindset, and um, uh, challenging us at every level concerning the preaching of the gospel, concerning witnessing for Christ, concerning our evangelism. It has been changing our mindset and challenging us at every level. So what then can we learn on this Lord's Day concerning uh, our evangelism, or what then can we learn from our missionary brother Paul? Remember, we are making it clear week after week in the pulpit and in the pews in our fellowship together, we are making it clear week after week that every believer is saved to serve the Almighty God. We are saved not to sit, we are saved not to just occupy space in a church. We are saved for a purpose. We are saved to serve the Almighty God. And every believer, you will remember, is, we said, is called to be a missionary. That's right. Whether you're a local missionary or an international missionary, every believer is called to be a missionary. There is only one of two categories you can fall into. There isn't a third option, neither a fourth option. You're either a local missionary or an international missionary. Local missionary meaning that you've got to serve your local community with the preaching of the gospel. If God has not called you to the islands of the world, if He's not called you to go to the far side of the world, then 
there is a great possibility that your calling is local. You have to be a local missionary. So there's either, you're either a local missionary or an international one. There isn't a third option. You'll remember from the Westminster Catechism, question number one. I wonder how many of you remember it. What is the purpose of man? What is the purpose of man? Question one. And the answer, very wonderfully, the purpose of man is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Amen. The purpose of man is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Brethren, my dear church, we glorify God in our worship of Him. And part of that worship involves obedience. Major part, obedience, that when we, when we obey what He told us to do, when we do what He told us to do, then that is our worship unto God. And that glorifies Him. Our obedience glorifies God. So on this Lord's Day morning, through the title of my sermon, To Live and Die for the Gospel, we will learn from the example of Paul, and we'll clearly see once again his conviction and his commitment, or his commitment and his conviction to live and die for the gospel. See how Paul glorifies God through his conviction and his commitment. As I make the case today, we will come across what most scholars, what most Bible teachers and pastors see in Acts 21 as an interpretive challenge. What is the interpretive challenge, Pastor? Well, uh, we have read what, uh, that Paul was counseled by the brothers, by the brethren, by the church, not to go to Jerusalem. Yet, he ignored them and he went ahead. Did Paul disobey them? Did Paul disobey the Spirit of God? Or did Paul obey the Spirit of God in going to Jerusalem? There are some who make the case from this chapter that Paul disobeyed the Spirit of God and shows, they show through their reasoning that he is a mortal man, a human being, therefore he's capable of making mistakes and this was a mistake he made in going to Jerusalem and not receiving the counsel of the brothers who spoke to him. Then there are others who make the case that Paul did not disobey, that in fact he was obeying the Spirit of God and answering the call of God upon his life for the preaching of the gospel. So here we have in essence almost an interpretive challenge and I hope as we unpack the sermon today, you will be clear by the end of the sermon what this means. But Before we get to that, let's just set the immediate context. We've been journeying with Paul over the last few chapters. And we read in, from verse 1 to verse 8. Let's read that. And when we had parted from them and had set sail, we ran a straight course to Kos and then the next day to Rhodes and from there to Patara. Can you see that on the screen behind us? So we ran a straight course uh, from Kos and then the next day to Rhodes and from there to Patara. We go back to verse 2. And having found the ship, uh, uh, crossing over to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. And then verse 3, it says, When we came in sight of Cyprus, leaving it on the left, so they didn't stop at Cyprus, they set sight of it, leaving it on the left, as you see Paul coming down, on the left, we kept sailing to Syria and landed at Tyre. For there the ship was to unload its cargo. After looking up the disciples, we stayed there seven days, and they kept telling Paul through the Spirit not to set foot in Jerusalem. And when our days were they were ended, we left and started out on our journey, uh, while they all with their wives and children escorted us until we were out of the city. After kneeling down, uh, kneeling down on the beach and praying, we said farewell to them. Then we went aboard the ship. And they returned home again. Verse 7 says, And when they had finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived at uh, Ptolemaeus, and after greeting the brethren, we stayed with them for a day. The next day we left and came, Caesarea. Paul stayed with the disciples for seven days. Luke, Luke doesn't tell us uh, what they did for those seven days. He doesn't go into any sort of detail as to what his daily itinerary was, 
what Paul did, what the brethren did for those seven days. He doesn't tell us all that, but I think he doesn't have to. I think he doesn't have to, for we, for we know, for we have a, almost a witness that when the people of the risen king come together, there is a great sense of thanksgiving. There is a great joy amongst the church, amongst the, the called out ones. There is, a, there, is a, there, is, there is thanksgiving prayer. There is a, a celebration of the gifts that God has placed upon the church. There will be much talk about the, the undeserving, the, the unworthiness of the, of the life that we have in Christ. For he has blessed us with salvation and, and, and righteousness and eternal life. And there will be much talking and fellowship concerning this. There is a great joy in talking about our master and, and on our, of his great love for us. That whilst we were sinners, he died for us. We rejoice, we rejoice when the brethren come together, when the church comes together. We rejoice that our hope and peace is, is found in none other than, than Christ our Lord. Maybe also, if we have a little bit of imaginative license here, maybe also they sang those days. They sang for many of those days. And maybe they sang what we sing today, in Christ alone my hope is found. He is my light and my strength and my song. This, this cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, what when fears are stilled and when striving ceased, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. I think they would have sang like that. I think they would have spoken like that. I think they would have prayed like that, like in Christ alone who took on flesh the fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid here in the death of Christ I live. And I guess even if we skip to the last stanza, if we go to the the last part of that song where I, I think Paul would have said wonderfully and encouraged the brethren, no guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me from life's first cry to final breath. Jesus commands my, my destiny. No power in hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand. So he returns or calls me home here in the power of Christ. I'll stand. Amen. I believe there's a great sense of fellowship around the centrality of Jesus Christ. I also believe there was a great sorrow. There is always a great sorrow. We cannot come together as a church, as the, as the, as the brethren, as the, as the church comes together. We cannot just come together and rejoice over what God has done and not in a way think and reflect on those who are perishing. Think on our nation and think on our community. Think of the, the people that are going through life. This sin-soaked nation, this sin-soaked city. Those who are living in total depravity. Those lives are an abomination to God. I believe then Paul and the brethren may have sung as we sing. We're facing a task unfinished. O oh, Father who sustained them, whose spirit who inspired, Savior whose love constrained them to toil with zeal untired. From cowardice defend us, from lethargy awake. Forth on thine errand send us to labor for thy sake. We go to all the world with kingdom hope unfurled. No other name has power to save but Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. I believe they, they had to. They had to. As Christians, we do. We cannot just come together and have food and celebrate and, th and, and, and have this great, this great celebration without thinking, without thinking, without reflecting, without it entering into our conversation about those who are being, about those who are lost, those who are going to an eternal damnation without the Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, Paul stands with these disciples. He stays with his disciples there and, and, and they had a message for him during those seven days. 
They had a message for Paul during that time of fellowship with them. They had a message for Paul. And if you look in the second part of verse 4, we read, And they kept telling Paul through the Spirit not to set foot in Jerusalem. They kept telling Paul through the Spirit not to set foot in Jerusalem. But obviously, Paul didn't listen to them because we read further on that he continues in his journey and there's a, there's a wonderful send-off on the beach and he continues on his journey. Now we'll focus on verse 4 in a few moments' time. But what we notice here immediately is the believing people who sent Paul off. Look at verse 5. When our days there were ended, we left and started on our journey. While they all, with wives and children, escorted us until we were out of the city. After kneeling down on the beach and praying, we said farewell to one another. Then we went on board the ship and they returned home again. What a marvelous picture. Can you just imagine that for a moment? These were not just men, but also women. Not just women, but they children. In fact, entire families came out to say farewell to Paul. How marvelous is that? Entire families came out to say farewell to Paul. Such was the devotion of these Christians. Such was the devotion that entire families were involved in saying farewell to Paul. And entire families were out there, part Entire families were part of this almost informal prayer meeting on the beach. As they all knelt down and prayed, they were there with their wives and their, their children, families kneeling down. This prayer meeting on the beach was filled not just with men only or women and men, but families, children were there. This was the church sending Paul on his missionary journey and the entire congregation was there. What a marvelous picture that is. And after this most blessed send-off, Paul is on his way to his destination. He's on his way to Jerusalem. And verse 7 says, And when we had finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived at Ptolemais. And after greeting the brethren, we stayed with them for a day. And the next day we left and came to Caesarea and entering the house of Philip the evangelist, who was one of the seven, we stayed with him. And this man had four virgin daughters who were prophetesses. Once at Caesarea, we meet uh, this man from the past, Philip. We've learned of him in the past. We've, we've uh, encountered him before. We came across him in chapter 6 of the book of Acts. And this is where the seven were chosen to take care of the church. So let us, for a moment, put our bookmark on chapter 21 and go with me to the book of Acts, chapter 6, and begin to read from verse 1 to verse 7. Now at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint rose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews amongst the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. So the twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, It is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we, whom we may put in charge of this task. We will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The statement found approval with the whole congregation. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. And here, here he is, the man we see, the brother we see in chapter 21, Philip. And then the rest of the brethren, he was one of the seven that were chosen. If you look at if you look at chapter 8 with me. In chapter 8, Saul is on his mission to destroy the church. He persecutes the church and we see in chapter 8 in verse number 1, Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. And on that day, a great, we're talking about, uh, you know, Stephen 
being killed here. And Paul was in, in full agreement on that. And on that day, great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. And they all were scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles, some devout men. Buried Stephen made a loud lamentation over him, but Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house and dragging off men and women. And he put them in prison. And you look at verse 4. Therefore, those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down into the city of Samaria, of Samaria and began proclaiming Christ to them. And the crowds with one accord were giving attention to what was said by Philip as they heard and saw the signs which he was performing. And we read further on about Philip's evangelism, even to the point of um, verse 26 and, and so forth concerning the Ethiopian eunuch. If you want to know more about those sermons, you can go online and look at them. But that's where we encountered Philip, you'll remember. And now we see him back again in chapter 21. If you go back to chapter 21, where your bookmark is, um, Luke calls him, calls Philip an evangelist. And I think this is how the church saw Philip. He was an evangelist. They saw his labor for the gospel and the kingdom. He was an evangelist. And as we read, even from chapter 6, as you read chapter 8 and then chapter 21, we find that... Uh, Previously, where Philip had been preaching, Paul, then called Saul, was wreaking havoc on the church. He was persecuting the church, arresting people, killing people. Now, these two men, Philip and Paul, are under one roof in chapter 21. Especially now, they are brothers in Christ, laboring together for the gospel and the kingdom. How marvelous is that? These two men who were once opposing each other, two men in opposite kingdoms, one was in the kingdom of light and God, the other one the kingdom of darkness. Now these two brothers are in the same kingdom, under one kingdom. They are brothers in Christ and fellow laborers for the gospel and the kingdom. What a glorious picture that is. Then we see in verse 9, Philip, Luke tells us that Philip, had four virgin daughters who were prophetesses. And the description of Philip's daughters here as virgins is probably because they were set apart for the ministry. And I think this is confirmed in these words, they were prophetesses. But these daughters were not a prophetic voice in the church. They were not a prophetic voice, for we know that that position belongs not to a woman, but to a man in the church. So these women may have been used, we think, to speak individually to people one-on-one, -on -one, declaring the divine revelation. On this occasion, in Paul's presence, they do not prophesy. They were merely present as members of the household. But another did speak, a prophet. And again, we are reintroduced to him in verse 10. Uh, and he says in verse 10, as we were staying there for some days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his feet and hands and said, This is what the Holy Spirit says. In this way, the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. So here is Agabus. And he reveals to all that are in that home what is going to happen to Paul in Jerusalem. And he reveals this, brethren, dear church, by the power of the Holy Spirit. In other words, God is telling them, this is what is about to come. This is what is about to happen to Paul. And we know Agabus from Acts 11.28. You can go back and look at that. Acts 11.28. The church trusted him as a prophet. What he said from the Spirit of God came to pass. So we trust him. He's one chosen by God to speak to the church. But here... Church, here the urgency and the danger that awaits Paul in uh, Jerusalem is not just spoken by this prophet, but dramatically spoken by him. Agabus uses Paul's own belt to show how Paul will be bound in Jerusalem. The warning here, there is a great warning, a stark warning. The warning is not just an audible warning, but a visual one as well. Dramatically visual. 
having heard this, having heard this and having seen this, like in the previous location, uh, all who were present with Paul, including his ministry team, they plead with him. They plead with him. Look at, look at, look at verse 12. It says, when we, uh, heard, when we had heard this, we as well as all the local residents began uh, begging him not to go to Jerusalem. Who's the we? Look at, read again. When we, the ministry team, heard this, then we, the ministry team, as well as the local residents, began begging him not to go to Jerusalem. This is, again, another time that Paul is being warned about what lies ahead of him. There is great danger, Paul. There is great danger ahead of you. Danger to his very life. And the people of the kingdom are concerned for Paul. They're concerned for him. And they beg him not to go. They beg him not to journey. Thank you, sir. They beg him not to journey. But Paul does not take their counsel. He does not take their counsel. He presses on to Jerusalem. So the question then we ask is, was Paul being disobedient to God? The answer is no. The answer is no. He was not being disobedient to God. But you may say, if you're listening to this, by, even by way of the audio broadcast, that you might say the scripture expressly says that dangers lie ahead for Paul in Jerusalem. And all this is by the Holy Spirit. It is said by the Holy Spirit. To that we say yes. The Holy Spirit does say that Paul is going to be in danger. His life is going to be in danger as he presses on to Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit does not forbid Paul to go. He warns him, but he does not forbid him. He does not stop him from going. Paul is told by the Spirit what lies ahead, but not told by the Spirit not to go. God is not stopping him from going. But you may say, as you will rightly raise your hand today, you may say, but what about verse 4? Look at verse 4. What does it say? After looking up the disciples, we stayed there seven days. And they kept telling Paul through the, through the Spirit not to set foot in Jerusalem. That creates a problem for us now, doesn't it? Because we're saying that Paul listened to the Spirit and he went. And, or the Spirit of God told Paul to go. Oh, sorry. He did, the Spirit of God did not stop Paul from going. But warned him of the danger. So what then do we make of verse 4? Verse 4 says, after looking up the disciples, we stayed with them seven days and they kept telling Paul through the Spirit not to set foot in Jerusalem. Surely we see here that the Spirit says that Paul should not set in foot in Jerusalem, right? Therefore, Paul didn't obey the Spirit. He operated in his own will and plan, right? Well, before we answer that, let's keep in mind who we're talking about here. Who are we talking about? We're talking about the Apostle Paul. His entire life is dedicated to the service of the Almighty God and aims to do nothing that does not please God and please God's will. You know, in all our previous sermons, especially even last week in his encounter with the Ephesian elders, what did we see? We saw Paul on a daily basis for those three years yeah, demonstrating the servant-master relationship. He knew he was a bondservant. He knew he was a slave to the master. And he demonstrated his obedience to his master in that slave-master relationship every day for three years. So this is Paul. He obeys the master. He knows what it is to serve Jesus. Let's, let's allow scripture to, to give us a, an answer here. Go a little further with me to Acts 23. Put your bookmark on 21 and go to Acts 23 and look at verse 1 with me. We'll cover this in the next. We'll come to verse, uh, sorry, we'll come to chapter 23 in um, um, September. So here's, here's, here's chapter 23 and verse 1. Paul, looking intently at the council, said, Brethren, 
I have lived my life with a perfectly good conscience before God up to this day. Amen. I'll repeat that. Paul, looking intently at the council, brethren, I have lived my life with a perfectly good conscience before God up to this day. Go to the following chapter, chapter 24. Look at verse 16. As in verse 16 of the 24th chapter, in view of this, I also do my best to maintain always a blameless conscience both before God and before men. In view of this, I also do my best to maintain always a blameless conscience before, both before God and before men. So all of what you read and heard from, from chapter 23 to 24 is just two examples. And all of this is after chapter 21, after Paul arrived in Jerusalem. And we see here in his testimony on both occasions, he's saying that his conscience is clear both before God and men. And a man says his conscience is clear before God means that he understands that he's free. He's not condemned. So if Paul, if Paul disobeyed the Spirit and went to Jerusalem without the Spirit's approval, then Paul would be guilty. He'd be guilty of sinning and disobeying God, and this would weigh heavily on his conscience. What we see here is that his conscience is clear before God. In chapter 23, verse 1, chapter 24, verse 16, his conscience is, is clear before God. Now that's important for us to know. Because it helps us then to better understand why he did not take the counsel of the disciples entire in chapter 21 and verse 4. So in chapter 21 and verse 4, when they said by the Spirit that he should not set foot in Jerusalem, now we have a, we're almost in a better place to understand what that means. What does it mean then? Paul knew what the Spirit of God had impressed upon him to do. He must go to Jerusalem and he must face the danger. The disciples in Ty in verse 4 were told through the Spirit of the danger that awaited Paul. But I believe, brethren, I submit to you that I believe they exercised in a way their spiritual license by warning Paul not to go further. I believe that they spoke from their own emotional state. They spoke from their own mindset, even from their own spirit. Urging Paul not to go any further. But Paul, Paul has been counseled by God. He's been instructed by God. If you, if you look at chapter 20 with me, go a little bit more to the left and look at chapter 20 and verse 22 to 24. This is what we did last week and the week before. In chapter 20 and verse 22 to 24, we understand where Paul is on this for it says, And now behold, bound by the Spirit, I am on my way to Jerusalem. You see that? He's bound by the Spirit. Not his will. Not what anyone else says. He says, And now behold, bound by the Spirit, I am on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city, saying that with bonds and afflictions await me. I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself, so that I may finish the course and the ministry which I have received from the Lord, Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. Ah, so we see that Paul did not, in essence, disobey the Spirit. On the contrary, he remained steadfast, steadfastly faithful, to the calling of God upon his life. And then verse 12 says, what are you doing? Paul, when, his, when, when they heard about this and they begged him to stay, it says, what are you doing weeping and breaking my heart? For I, I am ready not only to be bound, but even to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Paul recognizes their emotional plea to him. This is an emotional plea to Paul. Their tears for him move him. It moves him. And, and he describes 
their feelings of love and care towards him by these words, the breaking of his heart. What does he say? What are you doing weeping and breaking my heart? So he's definitely moved by their emotions, by their tears, by their care for him. But church, no matter how emotional that appeal, Paul would not be persuaded. He is bound by the Spirit. He's on his way to Jerusalem and nothing and nobody was going to stop him except God himself. Paul reminds them, as we are reminded today, that his life is not his own. He's bound in the Spirit to go proclaim the gospel even, even if it meant losing his own life. As he did in chapter 20, he once again leads by example, teaching us that the call and the preaching of the gospel as a higher value than his own life. He has been saved to serve and that he, what, that he must do, to that he must attend. In the previous chapter, we learned how Paul did not shrink back. You remember when he was speaking to the Ephesian elders, when he had this almost first um, conference of elders, he's talking, he's encouraging them, he's admonishing them, he's directing them. He said he did not shrink back from teaching publicly, house to house. In the previous chapter, we learned he did not shrink back from teaching. And here, he does not shrink back selfishly thinking about himself. He does not shrink back, but presses forward to the call of God upon his life. Paul later writes, later writes in in, in uh, Philippians 1, 21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. For me to live is Christ and, for me to, and to die is gain. Folks in the church do not speak like this anymore. These are the conversations that are taking place in the book of Acts. Between the church, in, in the church, between the, the brothers and the sisters, amongst the children. This is what Paul is saying for me to... For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. He knew that God had called him and God was with him. This is, the, this is the peace that Paul had, the peace with God and the peace from God. He later, we later go on to discover that in, in Philippians, isn't it? Talking about the peace. Peace with God and peace from God. As we... As we as he, knew, as he knew what awaited him, as Paul knew very well what awaited him, he did not run from it, but ran towards it. He did not run from the danger, but ran towards the danger. He did not run from the threat of death, but ran towards it. In essence, Paul was saying this. In essence, Paul was saying this. I'm ready to give what I cannot keep in order to gain what I cannot lose. This brother shared it with us at our barbecue. When was it? Yes. At our fellowship. This brother reminded us of this. I'm ready to give what I cannot keep in order to gain what I cannot lose. How about us today? How about us today? How about you today? Are you fleeing from the call of God? Are you fleeing from the responsibility of the preaching of the gospel? And yes, it is your responsibility and mine to preach the gospel. Week after week, it is the same people that are here. It is the same sister telling us of how many people she witnessed to. What about you? Are you fleeing from your responsibility for the preaching of the gospel? Are the emotional pleas of your children or your wife or your husband or your friends stopping you from fulfilling the call of God? Are there pleas of, please stay, please don't do that, please don't go ahead, please don't say that. You'll lose your friends, you'll lose your family. Do you know what will happen to you if you say that Jesus is Lord? If you say that Jesus is the only way, the only truth, and the only life? Do you know you'll be ostracized and criticized and persecuted? You'll be shut down. They won't invite you to the party. You won't have any friends. Please, honey, please, darling, don't say that. Stay here. Stay here. 
I'm ready to give what I cannot keep in order to gain what I cannot lose. Paul does not shrink back but presses forward to fulfill the call of God upon his life. How about you today? Oh, please keep your bookmark on Acts 21. Go with me to Matthew 10. Matthew 10 verse 38. May the Lord help us. May the Lord help us. Matthew 10 verse 38. Jesus is talking about the cost of discipleship. Now we'll just pick one section from there. In verse 38 he says, And he who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who has found his life will lose it. And he who has lost his life for my sake will find it. Verse 38. Almost brings to an end in that, ch in that chapter. Jesus is teaching to his disciples on serving him. And what it will cost them individually and together. What it will cost them. Oh my dear church. Our dear congregation, there is a cross for each one. There is a cross for each one and may we regard each one as his cross, your cross. Maybe as you listen to Jesus in Matthew 10, 38, it may be that the cross will not take us up, but we must take it up. By willing to endure anything and everything for Christ's sake. I say this to you in the way Agabus dramatically spoke it to Paul. I say this to you, that we cannot drag our cross after us, but we must take up our cross. And follow after Jesus. Dragging things are heavy. Dragging crosses are heavy. Carrying the cross grows lighter. But this is the case of the 21st century new fandangled, uh, skinny jean wearing, funky hairstyle, audiovisual display church that we must. You get to force people. We don't care. So we're dragging these crosses. We're not carrying them and following after Jesus. We're dragging them like they're a major burden. The church is telling me every week that I need to preach the gospel. So I'm going to do it. And you're dragging this thing, kicking and screaming every week. Here is Jesus. Carry your cross and follow after me. Oh, if we had time, we'd go and talk more about this. If any one of you deacons are thinking about preaching, uh, thinking about your subject for, for August, may you consider this text of what it means to carry a cross and follow after Jesus. Jesus says, follow after me. He didn't say, just carry a cross and go anywhere, but follow after me. So here I am as a man, as a believer, I'm carrying my cross and I'm looking for the footsteps of Jesus. As he walked so I will walk I'm going to follow after him. I will follow after him. Oh Lord, help us. Bearing the cross, we have to follow after Jesus. To bear a cross without following Christ is a poor state for a Christian. A poor state, my dear church. A Christian who shuns the cross, we say confidently, profoundly here today, without any fear, is no Christian. But a cross bearer who does not follow 
Jesus Christ equally misses the mark? It is, is, it, is it not true that nothing is so important to make a man worthy of, of Christ as a cross-carrying man following after Jesus? What a great shame it is to wear it and not carry it. What a great shame it is to have it hang around our neck but not carrying and following after Jesus. Oh, Lord, help us. May we say in our prayers, Lord, you have laid a cross upon me. Do not permit me to shrink back from it. Verse 39 says, He who has found his life will lose it, and he who has lost his life for my sake will find it. I say to you, brethren, today, if, if, if to escape from death, uh, a man gives up Christ and, 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 and finds that he lives, if, if, he, if he thinks about what he's going to do and he thinks that, that death is ahead of him through, the, through his Christian ministry or through his witnessing and he finds that he has life and he lives, what kind of living is that? What kind of living is that? For he gains the temporal at the expense of the eternal. On the other hand, he who loses his life for Christ's sake does, the, does in the highest sense find life. He makes the wisest choice. He who lays down his life for Jesus. As I come to a close, John Bunyan, when faced with going to prison for preaching the gospel, said this as he was thinking about his family. He wasn't a rich man by any standard. As a tinker, he was on the lower social economic level. So he was not a man who had a lot to give to his family. So as he's, as he's arrested, as he goes to prison for the gospel, for preaching the gospel, he writes this, and I quote, The parting with my wife and poor children hath often been to me in this place as the pulling of the flesh from my bones. And that not only because I am somewhat too fond of these great mercies, them being his children and his wife, but, I also, but also because I would have often brought to mind the many hardships and miseries and wants that my poor family was like to meet with should I be taken from them, especially, especially my poor blind child who lay nearer my heart than all I have besides. In other words, he's saying, we struggle through life. My family doesn't have much. But he said, these are the great mercies that God has given us, his great blessings that he has, his, his wife and children. And now as he's going to prison, he's thinking about them. And he says the very thought of, of what will happen to them is like the ripping of the flesh from his bone. What is going to happen? And he thinks about his children. He talks especially more fondly about his blind child. Of the hardship they will face without him. He says, oh, the thought of the hardship. I thought my blind one might go under would break my heart into pieces. But, he writes, but yet. Recalling myself, recalling myself, thought I, I must venture all with God through it, go, though it goeth to the quick to leave. Oh, I see in this condition I was a man who was pulling down his house upon the head of his wife and children. Yet I thought I, yet, yet thought I, I must do it, I must do it, unquote. Beloved, this was John Bunyan's conviction and commitment. This was Paul's in Acts 21, Paul's conviction and commitment. There was commitment and the conviction as we look through church history, as we've learned through the sermons when, when Polycarp was arrested and taken to the theater to be killed. We see that with Polycarp, we see that with Athanasius, we see that in church history with the conviction and the commitment of men and women, missionary men and missionary women and entire missionary families who left the comfort of England, got onto ships and sailed across the world, not knowing what to expect. 
Some died along the way. Some, when they arrived and set foot on this island, they said, thank God we are here. And the people came out of the, 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 the island and ate them, cannibals. These were men, women, and children of conviction and commitment. They said that they were to live and die for the gospel. To live and die for the gospel. What will you take from this sermon today? What will you take from the example of your brother Paul today? What questions will you ask in your reflection concerning your life in Christ? What questions will you ask about you and the cross that you're called to carry? What questions will you ask as you consider God's word today? May the Lord help us. Shall we pray?